Protesters around the world are calling out corrupt leaders. They demand accountability and justice. But can people's fundamental human rights be upheld in countries where heads of states themselves are marred by corruption? Hello and welcome to Bigger Than Five with me, Rida Fakhri. Every year, Human Rights Day is celebrated throughout the world on December 10th. This year, popular revolts have erupted in many parts of the world, accusing governments and their leaders of corruption and abuse of power. Millions of people have been galvanized in a wave of protests demanding the rule of law, accountability and an end to political corruption. Leaders in top positions are being called to account by massive, often leaderless protest movements, unified in their call for social justice, equality and human rights. Demands for an end to systemic corruption and impunity at the highest levels and respect for the integrity and independence of the justice system have become a powerful rallying call. We begin with a look at the nexus between corruption and human rights as Katie Fisher takes a look at the global fight against corruption at the top. Mounting frustration with inequality and political corruption. The people have had enough with their leaders' shady dealings. Sudan's ex-president Omar al-Bashir, ousted from power in April, has been on trial since August on corruption charges after millions of dollars were found in his home. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will face justice after being indicted in November on charges of bribery, fraud and breach of trust. He must resign his office today. In March 2018, former South African President Jacob Zuma was indicted on corruption charges and money laundering after a decade-long protracted legal battle. In Peru, the last four presidents have been jailed or are under investigation for corruption. Viva el Peru! Former President Alan Garcia killed himself when police raided his home to arrest him last April. Former Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak is standing trial this year in the 1MBD corruption scandal. More than $700 million in illicit funds allegedly landed in his bank account. In Brazil, former President Michel Temer has been arrested twice this year on corruption charges. Former President Lula was convicted of corruption and money laundering in 2017. He was released from prison last month, pending the outcome of appeals. And here in the U.S., it's bribery. Bribery. It's a hoax. Articles of impeachment are being considered by Congress, accusing President Trump of bribery in the Ukraine affair. Amidst this global pattern of scandals, will those at the top fall from grace or continue to grasp onto power? Joining me now to discuss the nexus between corruption and human rights is the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaid Adel Hussein, currently Professor of the Practice of Law and Human Rights at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we just saw a snippet of political leaders being accused or charged of corruption. So this may be the positive side of this story, is it? But how bad is global corruption today and how does it affect human rights? Well, it's a, it's a very serious problem. I mean, as of last year, it was estimated that uh, global corruption accounted for 2% of GDP, that the uh, total number, or let's say the volume in monetary terms of bribes paid by individuals or corporations amounted to about 1.5 trillion US dollars. Uh, some would say $2 trillion are, is wasted on corruption. And so it's an enormous amount. I mean, you could solve many of the world's health uh, problems, many of the world's uh, issues, uh, problems related to poverty. And so clearly there is an effect on human rights. And also, uh, from another perspective, those who are investigating these issues inside countries are often uh, at risk of being threatened and having their human rights uh, threatened by their authorities. As you mentioned, the justice system, the judiciary, uh, oftentimes very weak as an institution yes. or being subservient yes. to the executive branch. What happens in those cases then? How do you hold people in power to account? Well, it happens that in many uh, instances, a whistleblower uh, begins to siphon off the documentation to a director of public prosecutions or an attorney general. And you have in a number of countries rather brave um, uh, 
uh, judicial officials who begin to take these matters up. In Guatemala, for example, um, it was, uh, there's been a long list of attorneys generals who have been extraordinarily courageous and then ab abetted by a mechanism created by the UN, which now sadly I think has been removed. Um, so you do find it, but it is difficult, as you suggest. It is difficult, and as you say, it takes a lot of courage. Yes. Many would suggest that you were a quite courageous, outspoken uh, UN chief for human rights, but that the organization itself is currently suffering of a certain disease. Uh, some call it double standards, but certainly many see it as an erosion of trust in the institution because it is unwilling or unable to take on the most powerful, the most wealthy nations in the world, however corrupt they may be. I was interviewed recently and someone said you were the most hated person in the world. But it, it, that may have been the case where governments were concerned. But I think we were trying to speak on behalf of civil society, on behalf of those who had uh, human rights threatened. I mean, a, at the moment, there is this indictment one hears of the UN that it's too quiet. It needs to sharpen its tone. The, the atmosphere uh, globally is one of great anxiety. Uh, there's the sense of uh, that all the wheels are coming off at the same time and that the organization shouldn't be seen as a fair weather organization. It needs to be there when things are really deteriorating. But can it change at all? Is it a question of leadership? Uh, I, probably. Uh, you know, you often hear from the UN the remark, Hammarskjöld's remark, that the UN is not there to take uh, the humanity to heaven, it's there to save it from hell. It, it needs to save it from hell now. I mean, we, this is the sense uh, that we're adrift and it needs to do that. Um, look, if I can comment on the Secretary General, he's a very cerebral individual. He's very thoughtful. He's a highly intelligent man. And he probably believes he's acting uh, in a manner that's prudent in the best interests of the organization. He's not seen like this by many in the human rights community who view, who view that uh, or interpret um, his relative silence as a sign of weakness or a sign of uh, lack of courage. If you don't have the leadership of the UN speaking out, then I think uh, the verdict of future historians would be quite uh, savage. I mean, I, again, you, you may be acting prudently, but uh, ultimately, that's not going to be appreciated. Uh, it will just be interpreted as, uh, as weakness and cowardice. But would you agree that all this uh, illustrates that the UN isn't willing to, to uh, uphold the principles that it preaches when it comes to human rights? Well, the UN is a, a reflection of the world out there. And if the world is in disarray, the UN tends to be in disarray. I, the UN, uh, at least uh, from the point of view of the member states who make it up, um, you hope that the Secretariat, which the Secretary General leads, uh, is, sees itself as independent of all these forces and then approaches all of these countries in a way uh, that's even-handed. Well, with the, um, the current uh, international structure, the United Nations and other international and regional organizations being as politicized as they have yeah. become, you played an instrumental role in setting up the International Criminal Court? Yes. Should the world now be looking at another court that really deals with corruption yes. that's become so widespread? Well, th there is an attempt. Um, there I was contacted years ago by a federal judge in Massachusetts, uh, Judge uh, Mark Wolf, um, and he proposed, uh, together with some other jurists, the setting up of an international court that would deal with, the, with grand corruption. Uh, for obvious reasons, if in a particular country the corruption is so endemic and, and so pervasive that you're unlikely to see prosecutions uh, take place of senior officials, then you may need something international. And all of the protests that uh, were featured at the beginning of this particular uh, segment uh, could create a, a wave in the future and a demand that a court like this exists. So, so won't it be another ICC where we have seen all of the cases that were brought mm. uh, to trial have been cases Perfect. that involved African leaders, so typically yeah. leaders of weaker yeah. states, with yeah. a caveat that corruption also touches Western countries, doesn't it, yeah. and their leaderships? Now, I, I, I played a role in, in setting up the International Criminal Court, and I still believe in it. Uh, we, uh, the, those who led the um, uh, governing body at one stage, we, we addressed the court in a letter, public letter, where we said that things needed to be done because we were not happy with the performance. Uh, 
On the other hand, we're trying to overturn, and corruption included, we're trying to overturn thousands of years of, of human practice. And so if it takes us 50, you know, I'm not to excuse what is happening, but maybe we just need to be a little bit more patient with ourselves. And, and I believe the International Criminal Court will continue, will continue to go from strength to strength. And I also believe that the international, an international court uh, for dealing with grand corruption could be something in the offing. Not now, because the political atmosphere uh, at the you know, heads of government level is not going to allow for it, I think. But the pressure from people in so many countries may produce something in the future. And speaking of this popular pressure that we've seen on the streets across the Middle East, other parts of the uh. world, especially in the global south, yeah. where there, there are weak uh, institutions yeah. like uh, the judiciary. How do you see these protest movements driving the dynamics forward yeah. and getting people's demands that they end up with governments that are rooted in the rule yeah. of law? Well, I mean, there's some interesting uh, statistics that uh, came out last year. In uh, those countries where 60% of the respondents to surveys say that they pay bribes regularly, there's um, a five times greater chance that in that country people live on one dollar a day than in countries where 30 percent of the respondents say they pay regular bribes. So the more, the greater the corruption, the more likely the poverty, the extreme poverty that exists. And uh, eventually states cannot function at all unless they come to grips with these problems. So there has to be some sort of outside mechanism that assists them beyond the convention that we have on uh, anti-corruption, which most countries have signed, but alas, we still have all these problems. Outside mechanisms and outside pressure perhaps as well. Is the West yes. continuing to make a mistake by ignoring largely people's growing frustrations with corrupt leaders in the name of stability? Potentially, yes. I mean, if you have uh, growing disenchantment, you don't see um, uh, real incomes rising, you, but there's a perception of the income grab, uh, gap growing uh, 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 leaps and bounds, and added to this the perception that uh, corruption is rife, then you have a toxic mix from which unrest begins. And not to forget that most of the conflicts we see today originate from human rights deficits of this sort. Uh, it's not by two countries fighting it out on because of a boundary dispute. It is unattended human rights issues related to lack of access by a part of the population to the basic services that could otherwise be there were it not for corrupt practices you know, that leads to protests and then could uh, overspill into violence as well, very easily. Sayyid Radul Hussain, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, thank you very much for being thank here. You. Great to have you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Peru is a country that has been marred for decades by political corruption. Five of Peru's former presidents have been indicted on corruption charges. Corruption has also deeply permeated Peruvian society, from the courts to the police. And despite efforts to hold some of the country's top leaders accountable, 96% of Peruvians still say that government corruption is a big problem. That's according to Transparency International's latest annual report. We went to the Peruvian capital, Lima, to see how corruption is affecting those seeking justice. Pareja, que era yo, yo Vázquez Velarde. Tres veces le hizo cavar su propia tumba, ¿no? En bajo del hueco, tierra. Pudo salir de esa relación porque él la acosaba, la maltrataba, la entierra detrás de donde vivíamos. Luego de dos días la encontramos, mi mamá la encontró porque una perrita empezó a escarbar. Asesinó y él enterró. Le quemó, lo sacó los dientes, las uñas. Todos sus cabellos la había sacado. El sistema de justicia del Perú me mostró que no hay justicia. Solamente ellos trabajan donde hay plata. Cuando no hay plata, no, hacemos, no nos hace caso, no nos ve. 
no, no les interesa nada. Nos ve como cualquier cosa. Con ella estamos luchando hasta ahora. Mi mamá siempre detrás mío, siempre a mi lado, peleando, peleando. Ahí para que el Estado nos escuche, no tenga la comodidad de nuestro silencio nunca más. ¿Qué queremos las familias? ¡Justicia! ¡Y de los derechos de las mujeres! sobreviviente de violencia eh, de género. Usado como atenuante. El año 2015 eh, fue atacada brutalmente. Él estuvo detenido. Sin embargo, lo, lo dejan en libertad, ¿no? Lo, lo liberan de manera inmediata el mismo día de los hechos. Pasado ya más de cuatro años, van a ser cinco años. No, no he alcanzado justicia. En un determinado momento, cuando yo la trato de calmar, agarra y me corta con unas llaves en la espalda. Sabe que es una sentencia cuestionada. También sabe que para el Poder Judicial... El padre ocupaba un cargo político y, bueno, tenía familiares, amigos, eh, contactos muy cercanos también en, en, en cargos de poder en, en la ciudad. Y, y eso es lo que pasa y, y le sucede también a muchas mujeres en muchos de sus casos. ¿no? O sea, cómo la policía se colude con, con el agresor, con el delincuente, con su familia por algún tipo de beneficio, ¿no? ya sea por dinero, por favor. ¿no? Entonces, eh, o sea, a todo eso nos enfrentamos. Entonces, ¿quién, ¿quién nos atiende? ¿Quién nos defiende? ¿Quién nos protege? ¿no? So that's the situation in Peru, but the loss of trust in the justice system is widespread throughout Latin America and other regions of the world. So how difficult then is it to dismantle systemic corruption and how can leaders be held accountable for human rights abuses without a credible, independent ju judiciary? I'm now joined from Lima by Diego Garcia Sayan, United Nations Special Rapporteur on the independence of judges and lawyers. He's a former Minister of Justice and Foreign Affairs of Peru and a former judge on the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And joining me here in studio, Sarah Lee Whitson, Executive Director of the Middle East and North Africa Division of Human Rights Watch. Welcome to you both. Uh, Mr. Diego Garcia Sayan, looking at the case of Peru with the highest number of former heads of state facing corruption charges, would you say this is a sign of how bad corruption is getting, that it's getting worse, or in fact that societies are now more willing and more able to pursue these corruption cases? Unfortunately, the, the, the history of uh, most, most Latin American countries, and when that happens in many other parts of the world, is a history in which corruption has been permanently present. What is new is this uh, capacity of certain institutions to act and to react, uh, by which perhaps because there is more information, there is much more awareness in the society, so there are some possibilities in which uh, public ministries, prosecutors, judges, achieve a more independent uh, role, while simultaneously they are reading the polls in which, in many countries, the main problem is not anymore poverty or unemployment, not because those problems have been solved, but because there is much more information about uh, how corruption uh, affects society and affects the possibility of the states to handle problems like uh, health public education and so on. I, I want to show you either this, this, in this map. What, what shows uh, this, this map is that all these countries are part right now of a network of cooperation between public prosecutors and government uh, distributing information about uh, secret accounts, about uh, contracts and things by which after many, many years uh, one can see uh, people, high-ranking people from governments entrepreneurs uh, being uh, prosecuted, being investigated uh, in, in a context in which uh, that uh, thought uh, 20 or 15 years ago would be impossible. Sarah Lee, the World Bank estimates that bribery and stolen money that go into the pockets of elites around the world actually end up siphoning off around $1.5 trillion. Uh, that's about 2% of the global GDP money that would otherwise have gone into building schools and hospitals and roads and so on. Uh, the World Bank president himself also said that public enemy number one 
in the developing world is corruption. Do you believe that this is particularly true when you look at a region like the Middle East and North Africa? Uh, we look at the, the protests going on in, in places like uh, Egypt and Lebanon, but isn't it also overshadowing some of the other leaderships who are known to be corrupt that are close allies of the United States, whether mm -hmm. it's Egypt, Saudi Arabia, or Israel? Mm -hmm. Um, well, absolutely, and the problem, of course, isn't just the 2% um, that's referred to as officially corruption, um, but the part of corruption that's legalized corruption that's not even technically illegal. Um, the big problem we have in many parts of the Middle East is they don't even exist conflict of interest laws um, that prohibit government officials uh, from awarding contracts to themselves, uh, from having a direct interest uh, in business matters in which uh, they are governing and ruling. Um, there are also no transparency laws that require uh, government officials to disclose their financial earnings, uh, that disclose their business interests. Um, effectively, uh, we have a situation in Egypt where the government's military uh, has created itself for itself a monopoly of economic control that's uh, drowning out, suffocating uh, the private sector uh, in the country. We have a situation uh, in the monarchical states uh, in Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Qatar, um, where uh, the government, um, which of course are not elected, uh, actually also control the economy and own the economy and pay themselves and their extended family members directly from the wealth of the country uh, because they literally treat themselves as owners of the country. So what do you do in cases like these? And then you've got the more recent case of Israel where the Prime Minister Netanyahu has been indicted on charges of bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. What do you do in cases where you have very weak institutions that bend to the will of these autocratic leaders? Well, then you don't have an independent judiciary and you will see the country suffer and the people lose faith uh, in their countries. That is very much the direct reason why we are seeing these mass uprisings, uh, because people have lost faith in any uh, public institution that's able to protect them and protect their rights and hold government officials accountable. What you have is a breakdown. A breakdown, Diego Garcia Sayan, and it isn't just political leaders who've managed to hold the judiciary hostage. It's also violent gangs and organized crime in Latin America and other places. As UN Special Rapporteur, uh, you visited uh, countries like Honduras. You went to Uzbekistan as well. But in the case of Honduras, just recently, the president's brother was convicted in a New York court for trafficking in cocaine, while the president himself was apparently, allegedly, indirectly benefiting from the millions of dollars that were coming into his coffers for his political campaigns. Uh, this obviously highlights the hypocrisy, doesn't it, of politicians who claim to be um, tackling corruption and who are actually benefiting from it. There, there, there was a case in, in this year in, in Honduras in which uh, many members of the Congress were, were uh, connected and they were beginning to be investigated by public prosecutors that this process was cut by a decision taken in the Congress by the same uh, members of the Congress that were being subject of that investigation. So we still find situations in which that, that's now what we can call the classical way to intervene against independence by the political power to for their own benefit still exists. But at the same time, there are other sources of uh, attack against the independence that come from this uh, criminal organizations of corruption in which eventually, of course, they have connection with the political power, but they are made by entrepreneurs, militaries, big corporations. So at, at the end of the day, one uh, sees the world in a context in which the classical rules, uh, so to protect judges and prosecutors' independence, uh, which are oriented mainly to impede governments to intervene in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, the, in the justice system, right now should be uh, its scope should be eventually open to consider other sources, private sources, entrepreneurial sources, uh, big corporations that uh, looking for impunity, they are as well attacking and preventing uh, in, in independence in public ministries, in uh, prosecutor's office, and in justice. Sarah Lee, I mean, looking at this huge deficit in um, trust towards institutions like the judiciary and towards governments in general throughout the world. To what extent would you say that Western powers have been, to a large extent, responsible, if not complicit, in enabling the kind of kleptocracy 
that we see on a global scale. Uh, there has been a global failure uh, to uh, protect the rights of citizens uh, to uh, uh, stop aiding and abetting abuses, uh, including the kleptocracy that you mentioned. Uh, obviously, since we're here in Washington, um, the focus should rightly be on the United States and its role in contributing to human rights abuses in the region in supporting uh, uh, governments that have no legitimacy in providing military assistance to them, uh, in allowing them uh, to uh, rule by force, rule by oppression. Uh, through the military support that, that's given to them. Um, but I certainly uh, don't think that the United States or Western nations are alone uh, in standing by uh, and, and uh, enabling uh, some of the worst abuses around the world. Sara Lee Whitson and Diego Garcia Sayan, thank you both very much indeed for being on this program and for sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you. What is becoming increasingly clear is that people are no longer willing to tolerate that those who govern, whether they're elected or not, continue to enrich themselves at their expense. With the fear of calling out corruption at the very top now disappearing, people are drawing a line in the sand and putting their leaders on notice. From me, Rida Fakhi, and all the team here in Washington, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.